When the Sabbath was past, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll the stone? Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. And there you will see him, just as he told you. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Join with me as we stand to sing and praises to our great and wonderful God. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me Let me be singing when the evening comes Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul Worship His holy name Sing like never before, oh my soul I'll worship your holy name Rich in love 
love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Father, we thank you that we can come here this morning. Lord, we are here to celebrate the resurrection. We were reminded the other day of the crucifixion, but we're here now to celebrate the resurrection. Lord, we thank you that you rose from the dead, giving us new life. If you'd stayed in the grave, that would have been it. There would have been nothing. But you rose, you conquered the grave, you conquered death and sin so that we have a way to be able to come to you. Lord, we thank you as we come here this morning. We praise you and worship you and lift up your name. and pray that all we do and all that we say will bring glory and honour to you. Amen. Oh 
Please be seated. Thanks. Well, welcome to Mount Isa Baptist Church this morning as we celebrate and remember that um, Jesus rose from the dead, rose from the grave. And um, it's great that we can be here to remember that and to worship and praise our great and wonderful God for what he did for us that day. Again, welcome as we join with us this morning after the service. Um, please stay with us for a cup of tea and coffee um, over there. Um, so with children's ministries being school holidays, there are no ministries happening during that time as all the leaders have a well-earned break. Um, fun time play group will also not be on over the school holidays and that will return on the 22nd of April. Um, just a reminder for men, this Tuesday night will be hangar night out at the Salvation Army hangar. Uh, bring along $10 and have one of the best um, barbecue steak burg sandwiches that you can have. Um, if you'd like to know a little bit more about it, come and speak to me afterwards. But it's at 6.30. It goes from 6.30 to about 8.30 out at the um, Salvos hangar at the, um, out at the airport. If I could um, ask the stewards uh, to take up the offering for us at this, at this time. If you haven't come prepared for that, please feel just to let the bag 
pass you by. Thanks. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you provide so much for us. And Lord, as we were able to just bring back a small portion of what you give to us this morning here, in the way of our tithes and offerings, Lord, we pray that the money that we give, Lord, will be used wisely within the church as we look to serve the community in which we're in. Lord, that will provide for the services and resources that we need. We thank you for this blessing. Father, too, just want to pray for Margaret, who's um, still in hospital after having um, the medical, tr medical treatment. Lord, we just continue to lift her up before you and pray that, um, Lord, you'll guide the doctors and the medical staff that are treating her um, in how to manage her health. Lord, too, we just pray for Pastor Tim, Vanessa and the girls as they head off, headed off on their holiday yesterday. Lord, we pray that you'll watch over them and keep them safe while they're travelling and um, bring them back refreshed, ready to continue to serve you here in this church. And Lord, for the rest of our church family that are travelling away in different areas, Lord, we just pray for your safety upon them. And Lord, again, the time with friends and families to catch up and um, Lord, again, to come home refreshed, ready to continue serving you here in this community. Father, we, as we continue to worship you this morning, Lord, we pray, and also as later on as Cormac comes up to give the message, Lord, we pray that you give him the words that you want us to hear this day. Ask all these things in your name. Amen. just ask um, Bob to come up to the Bible reading. So if you're wanting to look ahead through to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. How's that? Much better. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the uh, believers in the city of Corinth. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the Twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Thanks, Bob. Join with me as we sing these next couple of songs, and after that, Cormac will come up with his message. Baby. 
bringas your son and leaving your spirit to your work on earth is done Jesus my redeemer name above all names precious lamb of God Messiah over sin a slain thank you oh our Father for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit to your work on earth is done. Let's sing it out. When I stand in glory, I will see his face, and there I'll serve my King forever. In that holy place Thank you, oh, our Father For giving us your Son And leaving your Spirit Till your work on earth is done Thank you, oh, our Father giving us your son and leaving your spirit till your work on earth is Christ alone. 
alone. Cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. Thank you. Please be seated. Thanks, Cormac. Morning, church family. <laughs> My brother-in-law recently encountered a situation where a friend of his posted an article in an online forum espousing the benefits of evidence-based critical thinking and how it helps to sway our minds. My brother-in-law linked his friend to a selection of research showing that contrary to what we would hope to happen, Presenting people with evidence contradictory to their worldview often does not sway or change their view, and in fact, can further entrench their already held views as they attribute less importance to, or outright dismiss, contradictory evidence. His friend immediately responded with, well, I don't agree with that, thereby demonstrating that exact principle. That notwithstanding, I believe that our Creator has made us with thinking, reasoned minds. He made us with the capacity to learn, discover, analyze, test, and reason. I don't believe that God made us to blindly accept what we are told, to have blind faith. To me, faith isn't blind at all, but it is a trust based on what you know to be true. It's that extra step not just to accept that something is correct, factual, or right, it is a matter of the heart. And there are people who have real, genuinely held questions and doubts about Christianity that they grapple with, and they want answers. I can understand that I'm naturally a very sceptical person, particularly when somebody has outlandish claims, like rising from the dead. I simply don't have time today to answer all of the questions or objections that you or people you may know have about Christianity, like God temporarily suspending the laws of nature that He created and governs in order to perform a miracle. But I do hope that I can cover one topical to Easter Sunday, that is, the main and most credible objections to the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. So to do that, we will examine the established facts agreed upon by historians regardless of their faith or worldview, the explanations for those facts, and if the resurrection is a true historical event, what does that mean for your life? As you have probably surmised, this is not really a conventional sermon, it's more of a history lesson. Now, the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 14 to 19, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ, that is, died, have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. You see, it all hinges on the resurrection not the crucifixion. Any madman can claim that they are the Son of God and end up being executed on a cross. But it really would take the Son of God not just to die, but to rise again, to conquer the wages of sin, which is death. So how do we determine what is true, particularly in a historical context? First, we must establish the evidence and agreed facts. Second, we must interpret the facts and examine various explanations to see if they fit the evidence. Unlike a scientific process that can be recreated again and again in a lab, 
to test various hypotheses, we must be more like detectives who examine the evidence of a crime scene and then determine what happened. It's also worth noting a few principles that historians apply to evidence to determine whether a particular account of history is credible. So we'll look at five of these principles briefly. The first one, testimony attested to by multiple independent witnesses is usually considered stronger than the testimony of just one witness. Second, affirmation by a neutral or hostile source is considered much stronger than affirmation from a friendly source. Third, people usually don't make up details regarding a story that would tend to weaken their own position. Fourth, eyewitness testimony is considered stronger than testimony heard from a second or third-hand source. And fifth, an early testimony from close to the event in question is considered more reliable than one long after the event. So what is the evidence? What are the established facts around the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus? I'm going to list only the minimal established facts that are agreed upon by credible historians, regardless of their faith or lack of faith backgrounds. Credible historians do not necessarily include your local whacked out internet blogger or YouTuber. The key words here are credible historians. Now, I apologize if I pronounce any of these old Roman guys' names incorrectly. My grade seven teacher, Mr. Shannon, had a saying that Latin is a language that's as dead as dead can be. It went and killed the Romans and now it's killing me. <laughs> so. so, fact one. Jesus was put to death by crucifixion by Pontius Pilate. Opinions on Jesus' deity will differ. Not everyone regards him as the Son of God, but no credible historian disputes that Jesus was a real man. This one isn't even debated. There is also little doubt that Jesus was crucified. Not only is Jesus' crucifixion recorded in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, but it is also referenced in a number of non-Christian ancient texts. Flavius Josephus, who lived from AD 37 to AD 100, was a first century Jewish aristocrat, military general and historian. And he wrote, when Pilate, upon hearing him accused by men of the highest standing amongst us, had condemned him to be crucified. Publius Cornelius Tactus, who lived from AD 56 to AD 117, was a senator and historian of the Roman Empire, and he wrote, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations, called Christians by the populace. Christus, from who the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilatus. Lucian of Samostata, who lived from AD 125 to sometime after AD 180, said, the Christians, you know, worship a man to this day, the distinguished personage who introduced their novel rites and was crucified on that account. Marabar Serapion was a philosopher in the Roman province of Syria and is also the earliest non-Jewish and non-Christian writer who mentions the historical Jesus. In AD 73, he wrote, or what advantage came to the Jews by the murder of their wise king, seeing that from that very time their kingdom was driven away from them. Crucifixion may not be mentioned explicitly, but he does state that Jesus was killed. And the Talmud, which is the central text of mainstream Judaism, reports that on the eve of the Passover, Yeshua, that is Hebrew for Joshua, the Greek equivalent is Jesus, was hanged. Being hung on a tree was a phrase used to describe the crucifixion. Clearly, death, uh, Jesus' death by crucifixion is a well-supported historical fact. Fact two, his followers later had experiences which they believed were literal appearances of the risen Jesus. There is virtually universal agreement that following Jesus' crucifixion, his disciples really believed that he appeared to them risen from the dead. Scholars reach this conclusion from a number of angles. Firstly, the disciples claimed that they had seen the resurrected Jesus. Now, you might disagree with their claims, but what is not up for debate 
is that they themselves believed what they claimed. The disciples later faced imprisonment, sufferings, torture, brutal executions and martyrdom. These weren't people who were merely believers convinced by someone else's testimony. They knew whether or not it was true. And liars don't make good martyrs. Additionally, we have ancient texts from first century church leaders who succeeded the disciples. And they testified that the disciples claimed that they had seen the risen Jesus. Clement was a bishop in Rome in the first century. From writings by both a bishop called Arrhenius and a church leader in Africa, Tertullian, we know that Clement personally knew the disciple Peter, which means what Clement had to say about Peter and the other disciples can be considered trustworthy. And what did he say? Therefore, having received orders and complete certainty caused by the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and believing in the Word of God, they went with the Holy Spirit's certainty, preaching the good news that the Kingdom of God is about to come. Arrhenius also wrote about the Bishop of Smyrna, Polycarp, who also knew Jesus' disciples. And Polycarp, in a letter he wrote to the church in Philippi, he writes of the Apostles, for they did not love the present age, but him who died for our benefit and for our sake was raised by God. In this letter, Polycarp mentions the resurrection of Jesus five times. So we have multiple early eyewitness accounts of the apostles claiming that they had seen the resurrected Jesus. Once again, many sources outside the Bible confirm this, but I'll give just one example. Josephus, who we heard from earlier, wrote, Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die. But those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. They reported that he appeared to them three days after his crucifixion and that he was alive. Fact three, the church persecutor Paul was suddenly changed. At first, this might not seem so relevant, but it is a widely acknowledged piece of evidence for the resurrection. Saul of Tarsus, as he was originally known, was a fierce opponent of Christianity. We read in the book of Acts that he went from house to house, rounding up Christians and throwing them in prison. He also looked on in approval as the first Christian martyr, Stephen, was stoned to death. But remarkably, Saul, who becomes Paul, ends up being the greatest Christian, Christian ministry missionary there ever was, and a martyr himself. This strange turn of events is also well documented in Paul's own letters, which became the New Testament books of Corinthians, Galatians and Philippians. We have Paul's martyrdom recorded in other ancient texts by Clement of Rome, Polycarp, Tertullian, Dionysus of Corinth and Origian. And therefore, we have multiple early first-hand testimony that Paul was transformed. So we must ask the question, what caused this change in Paul? The answer... Paul believed firmly that he had had an encounter with the risen Jesus. Paul was not someone who was merely convinced later on by someone else's testimony, as unlikely as that would have been. It wasn't a secondary source. It was a first-hand, personal encounter with Jesus. Paul knew whether or not it was true, and like the other disciples, Paul was willing to put his life on the line for what he claimed to be true, Jesus' resurrection. Fact four, the sceptic, James, half-brother of Jesus, was suddenly changed. From the Gospels, we know that Jesus had at least four brothers, James, Joseph, Judas and Simon. Now, we know from the Gospel accounts that Jesus' brothers did not believe him to be the Messiah during his earthly ministry. No, that is not all of them. We can read that in the books of Mark and John. We know that James believed the resurrected Jesus appeared to him based on the early church creed given in 1 Corinthians 15, which was our Bible reading today. Later, we see James pop up in Acts 15 and Galatians 1 as a leader of the church in Jerusalem. We can also read from texts outside the Bible, including Josephus, Hegesiphus and Clement of Alexandria, which are Christian and non-Christian sources, that James died a martyr we see a significant change in the life of James after meeting what he claimed was the resurrected Jesus, an event so significant that it changed him from sceptic to church leader to martyr. Like Paul, James was not merely a believer who became convinced, James knew 
whether or not it was true. Fact five. Jesus was buried in a tomb and the tomb was later empty. Although this fact doesn't share the near universal acceptance of the first four, it is supported by an impressive majority of scholars who have written on the subject. In fact, the scholar Habermas discovered in his survey of 1,400 works on the subject that roughly 75% of historians, regardless of their faith background, agreed the empty tomb to be a historical fact. So how do they arrive at this conclusion? Well, first, we know that Jesus was publicly executed in Jerusalem. His first appearances after rising from the dead uh, were first circulated in Jerusalem and the proclamation of the empty tomb as well. Christianity would have had no legitimacy whatsoever if those hostile to Christianity, including the Jewish leadership or Roman authorities, could simply exhume the body and put it on public display. But strangely, no such account exists in any ancient text, Jewish, Roman or anywhere else. In fact, even the enemies of Christianity infer to an empty tomb. Rather than simply pointing to an occupied tomb, they accused Jesus' disciples of stealing the body. This is found both in the Bible and in ancient texts, such as Justin Martyr, Trifilio, Tertullian, and De Specitalis. They would have been completely unnecessary if Jesus' body had been in the tomb, and furthermore, is an indirect admission that the body was unavailable for public display. Another peculiar part of the Gospel's account of the resurrection is the testimony of women. Women were the first to find the empty tomb and were the first to report it. In ancient times, any story that hinged on the testimony of a woman had immediate question marks. We today would think that this is awful, but in this period in history, a woman's testimony was not admissible in court apart from cases of sexual assault. Given the low view of a woman's testimony that people had at this time, it seems highly unlikely that if the Gospel writers wanted to invent a story of the empty tomb, they would include women as the primary witnesses. If you were going to invent a story, you simply wouldn't include details that made your own case less believable or less credible. So a brief summary of the agreed facts. Fact one, Jesus was put to death by crucifixion by Pontius Pilate. Two, his followers later had experiences which they believed were literal appearances of the risen Jesus. Number three, the skeptic James, half-brother of Jesus, was suddenly changed. Number four, the church persecutor Paul was suddenly changed. And number five, Jesus was buried in a tomb and the tomb was later empty. So what explanation do you have for these? Over the centuries, objectors to the biblical account have tried to explain it away with various theories. There are really only four that have any chance of refuting the resurrection. The first is that it's just a myth or a legend, a made-up story. Skeptics who propose it is a myth or a legend usually argue from two angles. The first one is they say that there were embellishments added that don't reflect the true story. The Gospel accounts were all written during the first century, within the lifetime of the people who were there when the events occurred. As they were still alive when the Gospels were put into written records, they would have been able to challenge any inaccuracies. In addition, as I mentioned before, you wouldn't include a woman's testimony because it would make your own case less credible. Any embellishments to the story would also have been added before the story was put in writing. This is because the sheer numbers of copies of the Gospel narratives that were made by scribes, that is thousands and thousands more than any other historical documents, these copies were disseminated widely and quickly. If anyone had attempted to make changes, these copies wouldn't match the vast number of others. They would be easily identified as being fraudulent. In any case, these kind of embellishments aren't argued by scholars for this reason. Paul's conversion is also difficult to fit into the embellishment explanation. He had what he thought to be a personal encounter with the risen Jesus. His conversion was not brought about by stories that he heard from others. Likewise, James, the half-brother of Jesus, dramatically changed after seeing the risen Jesus, not from what he heard from others. 
The second angle skeptics might take to try to explain away the resurrection as legend is to say that the gospel writers never intended their accounts of the resurrection as historical, but rather fictitious, like a parable. They question the genre of the text. But again, there are problems with this assertion. It doesn't account for the disciples being willing to lay down their lives for what they would have known to be a work of fiction. Surely, when threatened with death, they would have simply explained it wasn't meant to be taken seriously. It doesn't account for the empty tomb, which we have established as a historical fact. And also, like the embellishment approach, you have two men, James and Paul, a Pharisee, a highly intelligent and well-educated man who drastically changed his hostile attitude toward Jesus upon seeing him in the flesh. Do you think that these men would be so dramatically changed based on a fable? a story intended to be fictitious, it seems unlikely. So the second theory is fraud, that of a stolen body. There are two basic fraud, ah, yeah, there are two basic fraud theories that seek to explain away the resurrection. One is that the disciples stole the body of Jesus, but there are certain problems with this notion. As we have already seen, the disciples suffered terrible persecution and execution. We don't know of a single disciple that recanted. Could all of the disciples endure such hardships for a lie? Surely that's impossible. Surely they really did believe in their cause. Then, once again, Paul's conversion and transformation, who was an enemy of the disciples, he wouldn't have been convinced by a mere story propagated by the disciples, fraud, a stolen body would have been the first thing he suspected. And likewise, it is doubtful that James would have been convinced by the disciples because he rejected Jesus' divinity. He was a skeptic for decades, right through Jesus' ministry and miracles. Would he change his mind based on a story? No, he was convinced by what he believed to be an appearance of the resurrected Jesus. The other fraud theory is similar that someone else stole the body and tricked the disciples. But again, this presents problems. First, the empty tomb. The church persecutor Paul would have suspected foul play, so would have James. Second, the empty tomb wasn't convincing evidence for Jesus' followers. The Gospels themselves tell us that Mary Magdalene jumped to this exact conclusion, that someone else stole the body. Peter also was unconvinced. Thomas was not moved by such reports. They were all convinced by what they thought was the real bodily Jesus back from the dead. This is, of course, without mentioning that the tomb was guarded by Roman soldiers and the punishment for a soldier abandoning or falling asleep at his post was death. The third theory is that of a wrong tomb or a misplaced body. The third theory, ah, this theory claims that the disciples simply went to the wrong tomb or that the body had been put somewhere else. A similar theory is that the body was misplaced or even thrown away in the garbage pile and eaten by wild animals, as was known to happen to the bodies of executed criminals at this period in history. We can refute this claim in a very similar manner to the fraud theories as the same problems arise. It does not account for the disciples being convinced that Jesus appeared to them. It certainly does not account for the conversions of the skeptic James and the church persecutor Paul. Even according to the Bible, the followers of Jesus were not convinced by the empty tomb, even if it was the wrong tomb, they were convinced by His appearance. No ancient source even suggests the wrong tomb theory. If the disciples had gone to the wrong tomb, Surely, the Roman and Jewish authorities would have just directed them to the right tomb and exhumed the body. The fourth theory is that of a crucifixion survival. So, we've established that Jesus was crucified, but do we know for certain that He died? In 1986, in a medical journal, a team of three medical practitioners described the process of scourging and crucifixion and their effects. Scourging is what the Roman guards did to victims to sort of soften them up before they nailed them to a cross. And I quote from that journal. The usual instrument was a short whip 
with several single or braided leather thongs of variable lengths, in which small iron balls or sharp pieces of sheep bones were tied at intervals. The man was stripped of his clothing, and his hands were tied to an upright pose. The back, buttocks, and legs were flogged. The scourging was intended to weaken the victim to a state just short of collapse or death. As the Roman soldiers repeatedly struck the victim's back with full force, the iron balls would cause deep contusions, and the leather thongs and sheep bones would cut the skin and fatty tissues. Then, as the flogging continued, the lacerations would tear into the underlying skeletal muscles. If ever you want to see just what this would have been like, I suggest you go and watch the whipping scene from Passion of the Christ. This flogging was recorded in the Scriptures as well. In John chapter 19, we read that Pilate sent Jesus to be flogged prior to the crucifixion. The Roman soldiers then laid the victim on a wooden cross and drove large steel spikes through their hands or wrists, trying to hit the median nerve. They then overlapped the feet and did the same, though sometimes the steel spike was driven through the heels. Once they were nailed to the cross, the main problem the victim faced was breathing, and the cause of death was asphyxiation. Having been nailed to the cross, they would want to take the weight off their feet and so hang down by the nails in their hands. But in this downward position, exhaling becomes very difficult, so they would push up on their feet to exhale. The pain caused to their pierced feet was excruciating, and so they would revert again to hanging by their hands and eventually be too weak to repeat the process and suffocate. Surviving, an, a, a surviving a crucifixion would be an incredible feat. Furthermore, the Roman soldiers would have seen hundreds of crucifixions and would have known when their victim was dead. This was routine for them. But just to make sure, the soldiers rammed a spear into the side of the victim, just as they did to Jesus, to ensure that they were dead. So let's for a moment entertain the idea that Jesus survived the scourging and crucifixion. He was then placed in a tomb and in just three days had recovered enough to get up, push the heavy stone with his nail-pierced hands and wounded feet and then walked away a free man. He then presented himself totally mutilated to his followers and they all proclaimed him to be the risen Messiah. I think not. So there we have it. The four most credible, naturalistic explanations for the resurrection event. In my opinion, none are even likely, let alone convincing. But there is one explanation that fits the evidence perfectly. That is that the claims of the Bible about the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus are indeed true. Now, if you're one to immediately rule out the possibility of a miracle, then this explanation won't seem credible to you. But if just for a moment, you open your mind to the possibility that there is something out there that is beyond the physical, if you consider that there is something beyond the temporal, then this explanation is almost certainly the correct one. So, are you going to let the evidence sway your opinion? Or, are you going to be like the man in the forum who immediately dismissed evidence that was contrary to his worldview? While I've spoken a lot about evidence, facts and explanations, understanding or even being convinced of the truth about the resurrection doesn't make you a Christian doesn't make you a follower of Jesus. That's because being a Christian isn't just about understanding what is true. I put my faith in Jesus because of multiple reasons, but if I can summarize it succinctly, it would be this. Christianity is the only worldview that can not only give me good answers to my questions about how this world came to be and the structure of life and reality, but also answer those deeper, immaterial questions of the heart. What is my purpose? How can I have joy, satisfaction and fulfilment? 
Who am I and why am I here? The key element here is to be a follower of Jesus, you must submit to His rule over your life. That's the problem that so many people in our society have with Christianity. It's not that they aren't followers of Jesus because of a lack of evidence or intellectual disagreement. It's an issue of the heart. I understand why you might not want to hand over the reins to Jesus. Giving up control feels scary. But Jesus, not the church, Jesus is the one authority in all of heaven and earth that you can fully trust to be completely good forever. So good, in fact, so loving toward you, that He willingly died the death that you deserve, suffered the punishment of hell that was owed to you to save you from condemnation. And that's the best thing that we could hope for. The chief end of man, that is our purpose, is to glorify God by enjoying Him forever. He is the fulfillment of our soul. And many people ask, but why did He have to die? Why can't God just forgive me and let me go live my life without believing? Why doesn't the good that I do outweigh the bad? After all, I'm a pretty good person. The reason is because there is always a price for forgiveness. If I let you borrow my camera and you drop it on the concrete and smash it, but then you replace it, there is no forgiveness necessary. You've paid the price. However, if I choose to forgive you, I'm the one who it costs. If you publicly insult me and defame me, and then I forgive you, I'm the one who prays, pays the price of humiliation. There is always a price for forgiveness. And Jesus gladly pays that price for us. That's the difference between Christianity and every other worldview. Jesus offers you a saviour. Everyone else says do, but Jesus says done. The price has been paid. So, what does the resurrection mean for your life? It presents us with a choice. Do you want to live your life apart from God? Or do you want to submit your life to Jesus, accept His offer of forgiveness, and receive the fulfillment of your soul forever? I'll pray for us. Lord, thank You that You have given us thinking, reasoned minds. And I pray that we would see the truth of history, see the truth that is in Your Word, the Bible, and that we would willingly submit to Your authority and receive the fulfillment of our souls. Amen. Thanks, Cormac. Let's stand as we sing our final song.
suffering anguish, despised and rejected, bearing our sins, my Redeemer is He. The hand that healed nations stretched out on a tree and took the nails from me, leaving He loved me, dying He saved me, buried He carried my sins far away, rising He justified freely forever one day is coming oh glorious day oh glorious day one day the grave could conceal him no longer one day the stone rolled away from the door then he arose over death he had conquered now is ascended my Lord evermore. Death could not hold him, the grave could not keep him from rising again. Leaving he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. One day the trumpet will sound for his coming One day the skies with his glories will shine Wonderful day my beloved one bringing My Savior Jesus is mine Leaving he loved me Dying he saved me Buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. Leaving he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. Thank you for joining us this morning. Please stay for a cup of tea, coffee, and a chance to catch up. Thanks.